Good afternoon. We as up live, we coming to you from a rainy Bebecha. Today we host advocate Tembeka Ngaitobi, who is senior counsel, a well-known author of two books, Land Matters and The Land is Ours. He is also a political activist. Today we explore the important question, the land question and the negotiated constitution of our country. Uh, quite a number of things we are going to explore, ranging from where our problems started in Berlin, how Africa's faith was sealed in 1885, the Native Land Act, we're going to explore the genesis of our legal problems with the land, the constitution of South Africa, what does it say? Section 25 that we all love to quote. We would look at uh, issues of our ancestral land, expropriation without compensation, land reform, the possibilities of enriching uh, the elite at the expense of the masses. Uh, but let me not take it away from Advocate Mukai Tobi who is here with us. Good uh, afternoon, Advocate Ngai Tobi. Good afternoon, uh, Comrade SG. Thank you for, for the invitation. No, thank you for honoring us. Um, when we want to prove black excellence, believe me, we refer to you. Uh, when we want to dispute uh, attitudes against um, Africans. When we are told we are incompetent, we say, no, we have no guy told it. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for agreeing to be here. And well, as agreed, I would give you an opportunity to just speak to these matters. And I'm having one of your books right here, Land Matters, uh, which I would encourage people to go get, and also the second book, um, just speak to us about um, the issues of land in our country. What is the problem? What is the legal genesis? Where, what is your own observation? Where are we? Uh, take your time. We, we would then um, engage with uh, your presentation and then open it up to colleagues to ask questions. And we are joined by people on Facebook Live and many, many of our social media pages. Thank you very much, Advocate. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Comrade Estri, and thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a singular honor um, to, to speak this afternoon uh, to uh, the uh, uh, webinar organized by, by Azapo, um, an organization I hold dearly uh, in, in high esteem for its historical and the ongoing contribution it is making to um, uh, thinking about blackness uh, in the past, today, and in the future. So what I plan to do, my, my, my topic uh, has got two components. Um, the, the, the first component is the land question, but it's not the land question in the abstract, it's the land question in the context of our negotiated constitution. So that's the brief I've been uh, given um, to, to speak about. So I'm going to try and make sure that I speak about land through the prism of the constitution. Um, um, uh, so, so, um, so, so, that, so that's what should be uh, understood. And I'm going to try and explore what the constraints of the constitution are, but at the same time, what are its possibilities? Um, and I, I'll do that towards the end of my, of my talk. But maybe for now, let's just cover I would say common ground, ground that is indisputable. And the only people that dispute this ground are the likes of Afro Forum that are rewriting the, the history. So you've already referred to my book, uh, Land Matters, uh, which is published in 2021. And I wrote this book uh, in order to contribute to contemporary debates, but it also in order to clear sort of historical uh, mis- uh, analysis of where the origin of the problem is. My starting point is 1647, 
And that's where the book begins. It's in 1647. This is the time at which uh, a, a, a ship known as the Halem arrives in the Cape next to Table Bay. It is owned by the Council of 17, which is the committee responsible for managing the affairs of the Dutch East India Company. And at that point, the Dutch East India Company, Chalmax writes about this, the Dutch East India Company is essentially the brainchild of world capitalism. But it capsizes, this ship called the Harlem capsizes of the uh, Table Bay. For a period of uh, four weeks, some people die, others are stranded. But then the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, sends help to the Cape. And the people arrive there, they salvage what can be salvaged, and they return to Holland. One of the people there is uh, Jan van Riebeek. They subsequently write to the Council of 17. They write to the management. It's basically today you can call it the board of directors. They, they write to them. And then they say they've seen this land in the Cape and they have seen its potential and its possibility. Now, I, I want to just go through some of the things they said about the table. Um, um, and so the first letter is written by Leandert Jans, and it is called a short exposition of the advantages to be derived by the company from a fort and garden at the Cape of Good Hope. And then he seeks to persuade the company to occupy the Cape permanently. And then he says, the soil, this is the opening part where he says why the company should occupy the Cape permanently. He says the soil is very good in the valley. Everything will grow there as well as any other part of the world, especially pumpkin, watermelon, peach, carrot, radish, turnip, onion, garlic, and all kinds of vegetables. So the first point was the soil. We need to occupy the Cape because of the soil. The second thing he mentions in the letter is the labor. This is what he says. He says, some of the, uh, they call them, it's the K word, so let me not use it. Uh, some of the K word children may afterwards be employed as servants. So servants is a code word for slaves and educated in the Christian religion. That way, many souls will be brought to the Christian reformed religion and to God. And then uh, he submits this letter and it's motivated on three reasons. Reason number one, it's the soil. Reason number two, it's the labor. And reason number three is the spread of the Christian religion. That is why they must occupy uh, the Cape. And then he writes in a, in a letter later in, in 1648, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Dutch at that point have not yet decided whether they will occupy permanently or there will be visitors. So he then explains the experiences that the Dutch have found about these new people, these native people. And then this is what he says. He says, the natives have come to us with all friendliness to trade with us at the fort, which we have thrown up during our five months stay. So it was actually five months, not, not uh, uh, five weeks. I was wrong in the beginning. Bringing cattle and sheep in numbers. So this is very, very important. So the Dutch see this land. They think that the soil is beautiful and they think that the people can be turned into slaves. And they think that the slaves can be made to convert to the Christian religion. And then he is reflecting on how these new people have reacted to them. He says they have reacted to us in all friendliness. 
They have given us the cattle when we've wanted them, and they've given us the sheep when we've been hungry. So this is then the point of the starting of this idea of the Cape for permanent settlement. And now to make it clear, the, the, the natives of the Cape, the, 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 the koi that they found there, had not witnessed white people, people with you know, white skin, so-called white skin and, and, and loose hair for the first time in 1648. In fact, the record is that they had been visiting for 130 years before. There had been the British, there had been the Spanish, and there had been the Portuguese, you know, the early traders. But why were the Dutch different? The Dutch were different because of this idea of a permanent settlement. They wanted to settle permanently. But the permanent settlement as uh, the Council of 17, so the Council of 17 subsequently approved the permanent settlement. And they appointed Van Riebeek as the commander. But there was a controversy about the appointment of Van Riebeek as the commander because he was known to be very repressive, you know, because a military man known to be very repressive uh, of the native people that he found in Asia. Because what the Dutch wanted was basically to control the spice trade uh, from Holland all the way to Asia. So, but Van Riebeek was uh, uh, very notorious with his repressive um, uh, methods. And so it's in 1651, you know, that Van Riebeek is then appointed that he will lead this quote unquote voyage. Um, to the Cape. And at the very beginning, Van Riebeek is clear about how he is going to treat the natives. He is not going to treat the natives in the same way as Jans had done, and because Jans had this, uh, 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 today we can call it liberal uh, posture towards the native people. His very first letter uh, of Van Riebeek is a very aggressive one, and I want to quote what it says, and it's written in June of 1651. He says, I've also read in the statement that besides cattle and sheep at the Cape, a multitude of elands, steenbucks, and other wild animals are to be had. If this be true and a satisfactory intercourse established with the natives, in addition to the refreshments obtained, much profit, this is introducing the fourth dimension. We're not only interested in the soil, not only interested in the plants, not only interested in the labor, but we're also interested in the profit. He says, much profit might be derived from the skins of the beasts mentioned, which dried in quantity and packed closely, might be shipped into the outward bound vessels, which having consumed part of their provisions on fuel, would have sufficient storage room, and by then taken to Batavia, whence they could be sent on to Japan, where especially steenbuck skins are in good demand and will produce a good deal. So the settlement of the Cape is very important to the Dutch East India Company as a site of global capitalism, right? So he finally arrives in the Cape in, uh, on the 6th of April in 1652, right? And that's really the beginning of the problem. Because as soon as they get off the ship, there is a problem. Where are they going to stay? Where are they going to sleep? What are they going to eat? And from what Jans had told us of his experiences in the Harlem shipwreck of 1647, they have a very welcoming population that gives them ship when they're hungry, and that gives them cattle uh, to trade. And they began this trading relationship you know, uh, to survive. They began this trading relationship. But soon thereafter, that trading relationship turned into exploitation. And the local people refused to trade with the Dutch. They would say no uh, to these exchanges of bracelets and other useless ornaments. They quickly realized that these ornaments, which sometimes they got in exchange for trade, were actually pretty useless ornaments. And so when they began to resist this trade, at that point, the Dutch embarked on aggressive ways using guns, 
and using force and violence. And again, I want to, to refer to something here because this sort of early history is often overlooked at how violent and brutal was. So by the 1860s, the Khoi Khoi were doing all in their power to avoid trading with the Europeans. They would mislead expeditions, they would hide their stock, and when their options ran out, they would sell sheep instead of cattle. But the Dutch traders would not take no for an answer. They threatened that the governor would punish the Khoi Khoi chiefs who refused to trade. And the terms of the trade became wholly one-sided with prices set by the company, which is the Dutch East India Company. And here, this is the point I wanted to make. There is an exchange that took place in 1699, which captures this imbalance in trade. Ambroise Zasse, who is a trader on behalf, who was a trader on behalf of the company, told one of the chiefs of the Khoi Khoi, that he would not return to the Cape with the few cattle that the Khoi Khoi had offered. He asked, what would the governor say? And then Gauko responded, the governor will take me to the Cape and set me in the black hole, a dungeon. Is that butter? And what this black hole was is the, the Dutch would insist on taking cattle or taking sheep in exchange for these useless ornaments. And the Khoi Khoi were very smart people would refuse this because there was no reason why they should give away their instruments of trade. But because at that point, guns and force were already used, what the Dutch would then do in punishment if you are refusing to trade with them is to, is to dig up this hole outside of the fort because they built up this fort. They would dig up this hole outside of the fort and then they would basically bury the person responsible for refusing to trade up to here, up to their neck. And they would either shambok them or kick them. And after a few minutes, take them out and then ask them, do you still refuse to trade? And so this is what Bago is referring to here. And then he says, the governor will take me to the Cape and set me in the black hole. Is that butter? In other words, is this trade if I am forced to trade? So this is then the early period. It's, it's the brutality of the early period, right? That's characterized by unfair terms of the trade. The Dutch grow in their aggression. And they have now acquired some land, but they want to establish agriculture. How did they do this? So again, you find most of this, it's in the Van Riebeek diary. Um, and it, it's a story I also picked up from the 1657 parts of the diary. And what they did, and here is very important about how they started agriculture. They passed a resolution, which is the Dutch East India Company, to give the free men, these were the beggars, the, the, the farmers who had left the company, but they were white, a helping hand wherever necessary so that they can make an early and favorable start and progress. So they must be helped to make an early and a favorable start. Now, this free hand included freehold in land. It would be given land in free title. They would also get slaves. They would also get plowing implements. They would also be exempt from paying tax for a period of three years. And the land that has been taken from the Khoi and given to them would remain their property forever to do with it as they like. That is, they may sell, lease, or otherwise alienate it. And then finally, the company would also guarantee them access to the market as all the produce will be bought by the company. And then there was only one condition which is the cattle required for plowing and in due course for breeding purposes should be bought from the company. So that dream that began in 1647 is now being realized fully and they're beginning agriculture. And the way they begin agriculture is you get the land for free, 
you get the workers for free, you don't pay tax, and then you get easy access to the, to the market. And so I thought we should start here because whenever I see debates today about black farmers um, not being able to produce according to scale or not being able to produce to fix the problem of food uh, shortages, people forget that actually the way that farming began in the Cape in Van Riebeek's time was to create these conditions where the land is free, the labor is free, um, the implements are free, and there is a guaranteed market where you will sell this. And then black farmers are asked to just get on with it without any of these preconditions that are expressly required. So when the smallpox epidemic of 1713, which again is responsible for a lot of devastation. But the problem is that that smallpox epidemic in the Cape is not responsible for the killing of the of the toys in the numbers that I you know exaggerated. It's a contributing factor, but but a lot of it is is genocide. So those wars take place, and a lot of it are genocidal wars. Some of these um, uh, uh, Dutch men um, want freedom from the company and travel through the interior and through the Eastern Cape and they encounter, you know, the tossers. Um, and even there, there are wars, but there is absolutely no way that in those wars, they can um, destroy the tossers. The tossers are a formidable force. And the big difference is the introduction of the British uh, from 1799. It's the introduction of the British, and the British brings lots and lots of weapons, and they put the Cape under British administration. And once they put the Cape under British administration, I think the die is almost cast. And the next hundred years of resistance ultimately result in a defeat, the last war in 1878, uh, Maya war. The entire Cape is really firmly settled by the British and they extend their influence to Natal. And Natal is founded as an extension of the Cape. You know, they send administrators there, but those administrators are Cape administrators and Natal is part and parcel of the Cape. And 1879, everybody knows it's Andrana. It's a temporary victory by, by the Zulus, but ultimately they are destroyed at uh, Rock's Drift, you know, and they are placed uh, under the British. Ingosi, uh, ultimately goes to Queen Victoria, but the terms of that negotiation are so one-sided, you know, uh, it's so clear that they, they simply cannot recover, you know, the lost ground. And if he comes back, he will come back as a much diminished king with a diminished role, but paying allegiance to the British and the two areas, Natal and the, and the Cape. And so, so that I thought we should just clear that uh, because the, the, there's quite a lot of sort of disinformation, deliberate disinformation about, well, the, 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 the British arrived at about the same time as the Ngunis. The Cape the Ngunis had been in this area for more than a thousand years um, on historical archives and all of those. And so the land is ultimately taken by force, by violence, by subjugation. So that is, is clear. And the country itself is new. South Africa is a new country. It's established in uh, 1910 uh, after the three centuries of war, which included pillage and plundering. And you can add on that discovery of diamonds, the discovery of gold, which introduces uh, capitalist interests and the need for the British to look after the Cape, uh, particularly Kimberley, and then the British to be interested in the transfer, which prior to that, they were actually not interested in the transfer. They were not interested in what Kruger was doing. 
but it's the diamond, it's the it's the gold in the transfer that kicks their interest. And remember the first guy who tried to occupy um uh, transferred on behalf of the British John Shepston. John Shepston was a first generation uh, South African. Uh, his father, Shepston, was one of the 1820 settlers. His brother was Theophilus Shepston, you know, the notorious governor of Natal. But they became really interested in the transfer of the gold. They had been interested in the Cape. The Cape had been their crown jewel for years, competing actually with India, you know, in terms of level which were the most important uh, British possessions outside of, uh, of Europe. So, so these, these were the two, it's, it's the Cape and, and India, and Transvaal became important once, quote unquote, they discovered um, gold. And that gold trade also created new conditions for, for settlement. So when they decided then uh, in uh, 1910 to form a country, you know, they, had a lot of interest in the in, in Transvaal. They also had interest in the Free State because the border of the Free State and the Northern Cape today, you know, is where these diamonds are found, uh, particularly the alluvial diamonds. You know, and and the early land disputes about whether an area is in the Transvaal or is in the Cape, where around where the diamonds are found. Um, and so they were always interested in the Free State because of its uh, uh, the commercial value, interested in the Cape, interested in Natal, and in the transfer. So it made sense to consolidate free state, transfer, Cape, and Natal into one country. And there was a debate what to do with Swaziland, what to do about Lesotho, uh, and what to do about Botswana. Ultimately, the decision was to make those British protectorates. Um, they were not included. And the big parts were then included. But the question was still, what is the position of the natives in the new South Africa? This is the 1910 constitution. It's actually the Union Constitution of 1909, which came into effect on the 31st of May, 1910. It still did not resolve the question of what to do with the natives. And primarily the question then is the question of citizenship. Are the natives going to be regarded as citizens or not? Right. And the decision is, well, they should not be regarded as citizens. Citizenship should be reserved for people with British heritage or people with other European heritage, but primarily Dutch heritage. And at that point, they are consolidating a new identity, the Dutch, the Afrikaner identity or the Boer identity. They are consolidating it. And the British identity has always, quote unquote, been pure identity. It's never transformed, right? So if the natives are not citizens, right, under the law, they have no entitlement to franchise, you know, and they have no entitlement to ownership of the land, what would their rights be? And so this is the debate that begins then two years after the formation and of the union. And the person driving this debate is Barry Etzoch, who is a minister of native affairs in the first government of uh, um, uh, Borta, Louis Borta, uh, General Louis Borta, he's the first prime minister of this new South Africa. And, and Barry Atok is interested in the native question, where are we going to put the natives? Because they're not citizens, but they are here and they are the majority, what are we going to do with them? So he then begins in 1912 to draft a law, and he doesn't know where he's going at the beginning. He drafts this law, which is the native's bill, you know, drafts this law. And this law is then the foundation of the Natives Land Act. But by the time it went to parliament in June of 1913, Berezo had left parliament. It was Sawa, if you in Johannesburg, you know Sawa Street, it was Sawa who was the Minister of Native Affairs, right, who introduced the bill. In, 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 in Parliament. And the most important thing about this bill, the most important thing about this bill is that it then separates South Africa into European and native, European and native. 
So once you then do that, you separate the countries European and native, you have to then define who is European, who is native, right? And most of that work, and actually people again don't uh, appreciate this, most of that definition, the racial definition had been done by judges. It's the lawyers who came up with racial classifications. Because once you say there are natives and there are Europeans, you have to then explain in legal terms, how do you know that a person is a native? How do you know that they are European? And most of it was just physical characteristics. It was as arbitrary as that. It's physical characteristics. Of course, there was heritage, there was birth, right? But if a person walked into an office of the native for commissioner affairs, and they had to decide whether they were native or European for the purposes of processing whatever entitlements they were claiming, most of that work was done by physical characteristics. So that's the brief history to the Native Land Act. When it is passed, what it does is to divide the country into two, 93% for European settlement, 7% for native settlement. And then it contains in the opening section, section one, the prohibition against natives from acquiring land. So they may not buy land in European areas, except with the permission of the governor, which was never given. And then it then pretends in the following section to introduce a similar prohibition on Europeans not to acquire land in native areas, except with the permission of the governor. But why would they, if they control 93% of the total land surface of the country? Right? So this is the big story then. What began as war was consolidated into law. So the entire South African story is then consolidated by the 1910 Union Act, which primarily is about citizenship, and the 1913 Native Land Act, which is about land, but is giving effect to the debate around citizenship. So that is what has been the backbone to the struggle for freedom. The early ANC generation was concerned about this question around how are we going to address the settlement of Europe of land that previously belonged to indigenous Africans. The PAC also was concerned about this question. Your own organization, Azapo, was concerned about this question. And it manifests itself in different ways. It manifests as agricultural land. It manifests as urban land. It manifests as residential land. But it's still this question around citizenship. How are you going to tell who's a citizen and who's a non-citizen? You tell primarily by their relationship to the land or the natural resources of the country. Now, I want to move on then uh, to the next big part of my assignment, which is the constitution. As you, you said, I should talk about the land question. I've tried to, to give that a historical flavor, and then I want to talk about the constitution. I'm going to try and give that a contemporary uh, flavor. Now, what happened then is in 1990, I mean, the primary organization that really drove the, 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 the constitutional negotiation process was the ANC, right? There was ambivalence on the part of the PAC, and there was ambivalence on the part of Azapo about whether to participate in this process, right? But Mandela took it up and then drove it um, to the conclusion. So most of the work around this period of the transition is work driven by the ANC. And there's already critique at that point. I mean, I, when I looked at the CODESA document, I was actually, it was remarkable when I was writing Land Matters, when I looked at the CODESA documents, that some of the critiques of today around the failure to deal with the economy and the failure to deal with land, they appear today as new critiques, but actually these were critiques made as early as 1992 by Clarence Makwetu, you know, who was the, the president of the, of the PAC. But these were drowned down uh, in the clamor for, you know, let, let's vote, let's get freedom now. So what the structure of the constitution was uh, on land, um, there are two provisions. There is the interim constitution and the final constitution, but I'll focus primarily on the final constitution. What the structure of it on land, I mean, I counted the number of times 
the word land appears in the constitution, right? I came to one, uh, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it appears five times uh, in the constitution. So it first appears in the preamble. You know, and the preamble says, we honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. Right? And then the following line talks about our country. It seems that country and land are used interchangeably and they're not the same thing, but at the same time, they are the same thing. But the four other occasions it appears is in section 25. That's the four other occasions. Firstly, it's under subsection four, which says that property is not limited to land. And that's the section that talks about uh, uh, the public interest includes the nation's commitment to land reform. And then B, property is not limited to land. Again, they, 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 it appears there. And then it also appears as an injunction, as an instruction to the government. It says the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land on an equitable basis. And then again, it appears in as a right, not as an instruction to the state, but as an entitlement of citizens. It says a person or community whose tenure of land is legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices is entitled either to tenure, which is legally secure or comparable redress. And then the section that tries to redress what happened in 1913 is not limited to land. It just says a person or community dispossessed of property. In other words, the bigger concept. After 19 June 1913, as a result of past racially discriminatory laws, uh, is entitled to the restitution of that property or to equitable redress. And then the last part where land appears is in sub eight. It says no provision in this section may impede the state from taking legislative and other measures to achieve land, water, and related reform in order to redress the results in chapter, uh, the results of past racial discrimination. So what does this whole thing mean? I want to break it down into two. Right, I'm going to talk about expropriation in a moment, but I want to just focus on what are the rights that are contained in the Constitution as far as land is concerned, and what are the obligations imposed on the state so far as land is concerned. So what the Constitution does, it gives us a right to gain access to land on an equitable basis. So we, everyone is entitled to gain access to land on an equitable basis. The state has an obligation that corresponds with that to implement measures within available resources to ensure that those conditions are fulfilled, right? So that's the, the first right, correlative duty, right? So it's right, correlative duty. We are all entitled to land on an equitable basis. What does this mean, land on an equitable basis? So basically what this means is that we are entitled to land if we need it and we cannot afford it. So if you need the land, you cannot afford it. The constitution says you are entitled to it, right? And it says the government is under a duty to ensure that that happens. And of course, it must do so within available resources. So it must ensure that those who need land but cannot afford it, they get. So, so this is what is generally referred to as land redistribution. It's this idea that every citizen of this country and it says it enables citizens, and there's a big problem there because it excludes non-citizens. So people from Zimbabwe, uh, Malau, who are here as migrant workers, really, they have no right under the constitution to be given land on an equitable basis. This is a right that accrues to citizens, and there's a big debate around whether you know, it's appropriate to do so in a country where everybody accepts that African migrant labor gravitates towards South Africa. So that's number one. We are all entitled to land if we need it, but we cannot afford it. And then there's a narrower category of people that are entitled to land, which is under section seven of subsection 20, I mean, of section 25, which is if you were dispossessed of property after the 19th of June, 1913, you are entitled 
to the restitution of that property or to equitable redress. In other words, if they can't give you that property, they must give you something equivalent or to compensate for the fact that you lost property. So those are the two claims that are built into the constitution, right? Both of these claims were very contentious claims during the negotiations. They were heavily opposed by the National Party, promoted by the ANC, and they made it to the constitution. The, the 19th of June, 1913 restitution process, right, is what the Land Claims Court and the Commission for the Restitution of Land Rights were established for. And what they were supposed to do is to conduct an investigation. So if you lodge a claim, you say, well, I want to lodge a claim, my family were dispossessed, and you can pick a date and whatever. They would investigate it, bring it forth, and if you can settle, you take the money or you take the land, and the farmer is paid and they disappear. You can get that land. But those were the 1913 claims, 1913 onwards claims, right? There is a problem with that. And uh, I've tried to reflect on that problem in, the, in, in, in my book. The, the, the first problem is that from the, and the, that's the reason why I, I began with where I did, which is 1647. The problem with that is that 1913, by definition, is an exclusionary period. It excludes so much of historical dispossessions. In fact, it excludes the majority of dispossessions, right? And the actual numbers, the, 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 the numbers of people that were dispossessed after 1913, I mean, we know the numbers, about 5.6 million people, right? Uh, so this was a provision to solve a narrow problem, which is called forced removals. This was the forced removals provision. It was not a land reform provision. Right. It was to address forced removals. The provision for land reform was access to land on an equitable basis. But that's the primary engine for land reform is everyone who needs land and cannot afford it should get it from the state. So that's what should have driven land reform. Now, the ANC also thought about this in the same way. When I read the uh, ready to govern document, and I read the RDP, both of them actually said, we will never achieve land reform through the restitution process, because the restitution process is for a specific group of people. It's for victims of forced removals. We've got to have another way of getting land. And so let's not put restrictions of 19th of June, 1930. Let's just put need. You want the land, or let's not say one, you need the land but cannot afford it. It's the only criteria in the constitution, right? But the problem was that as soon as they became the government, right, they completely abandoned section 25, subsection 5, which was the primary instrument for land reform, right? And they focused on restitution, which is subsection 7. So most of the discussions we've been having in South Africa have been discussions about the failure of restitution, right? Yes, sure, restitution has failed, let's admit that. The intention behind restitution in the RTP document, even then it was a very modest intention, was let's give 30% of agricultural land to black people in the first five years. And in fact, the land claims court itself, according to the RTP document, its tenure was five years. Even the commission, its tenure was five years. They were all meant to finish after five years because by 30%, they thought that would be a sufficient sort of threshold you know, to be satisfied that we're making enough progress. And then these institutions would fold. And then the next stage of land reform would then be land on a net basis. But we, what we know is after 30 years, we are still, in my book, I said we were at 9%. The, uh, there was a, a clamor. Um, some professors from Stellenbosch, they said my numbers were wrong. But in December 2022, President Ramaphosa actually confirmed that on the government's own figures, they were at 11%. So, which shows that my number, in fact, was correct. Right. 
And in fact, more than that, I mean, this is again something I I have I need to cite this because it's very crucial just to understand the scale of the problem. Um, so, and I've cited this at in my book at. Yes, page one one one, and so th this is to explain if we continued on the current trajectory. So I've said mine was nine percent, Ramaphosa's is eleven percent. I'm happy to take the president's number, but if we continued on the current trajectory on that restitution alone, this is what Halema Motlante found in twenty seventeen, right? He said that. Um, it would take us 35 years, that was in 2017, 35 years to finalize all the older claims. And then 143 years to settle new order claim. And if the claims are reopened, 709 years to complete land restitution. So another 35 years, if we only work on the existing claims. So it's, 30 plus 30, uh, plus 35. So that's 65 years after freedom. And uh, 60 years after the first five years that was projected by Nelson Mandela. And then 143 years with new order claims alone. And those are the new order claims that came. I think President Zuma opened the process in 2013. And then to complete the whole thing of land restitution, 709 years. So that just places that in. In, 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 in context, right? So where do we go then um, with, with this? So my suggestion that, that are suggested in the book is to return to the original idea, which is if you're gonna try and resolve what essentially we're dealing with in South Africa, if, if you are true to history, right? If you're true to history, the history of violent dispossession by Europeans. Let's just face that it's violent dispossession by Europeans over native land. And in the middle of that violent dispossession, they stop, they don't really stop the violence, they convert the violence into law. So it's the violent dispossession given an imprimatur of law. And that's what we are trying to undo. So if we do not seriously try and do that, we have to appreciate that 1913 was an error. But nevertheless, the restitution process needs to be finalized. It needs to be closed. The, the idea that there are claims made in 1998 and they are still in the system, there are 5,800 claims made by the cut of date of 1998 that are still in the system, not been resolved, but those must be resolved. But if you're going to resolve, really what South Africa is grappling with is land injustice. Really, that's what it is. It's land injustice. So if the issue is land injustice, we are not going to resolve land injustice by trying to find out who was dispossessed where. I don't have evidence. Personally, I don't have evidence of my father or my mother being dispossessed. But I know by virtue of being Black that they are part and parcel of a category of people that were victims of racial discrimination, systematic racial discrimination. So, which means that I am looking for something different to resolve the, the problem of land injustice, right? Which takes us back to what is in section 25, subsection five, which is there is in fact an obligation on the state to ensure that we as citizens receive or gain access, doesn't say receive, gain access to land on an equitable basis. How, how do we achieve this? So the first step is to appreciate that the goal is let's give as many people as possible land and let's do it on an equitable. And equitable is very important because it addresses the central problem, which is we have a lot of concentration of land in private hands, uh, annual concentration. 72% of all productive land is owned by white people. And you are not going to address the problem unless you focus on privately held land, right? Because to say, well, let's look at state land. What do we know about state land? It's 18 million hectares. That's, and only 2% of that is actually redistributable in the sense that it is usable because 
State land is not really a, hel a helpful point to look into because there are forests, there are railways. So it's not as if you can give that land for settlement or for agricultural usage. So, so the engine has to be privately held land. What to, we've got to focus on privately held land and we've got to do it on an equitable basis, which means if it is, if the current pattern is inequitable, there is an obligation on the state to break that inequity because the constitution says it must be equitable. And it doesn't say it must be equal, it says equitable. So which means it appreciates that you are beginning from the premise of inequality and you're trying to resolve the problem of inequality. Now, this is what the ANC government has actually avoided for the last 30 years. It's avoided addressing the question of access to land on an equitable basis. How did it avoid this? The starting point should have been to pass a national law called, and I've given them the title, Land Redistribution, or the Land Redistribution Bill. Should have been the starting point, should have been agenda number one after freedom. Let's get on with the Land Redistribution Bill. And its purpose should have been simple, twofold. And again, I've dealt with this. Number one is how does the state acquire land? So it should have dealt with the question of acquisition. Number two, once acquiring, how does it distribute it? And distribute it in a way that promotes equity, right? Now, on the first part, which is acquisition of land, that is where the whole issue of expropriation comes in. But it's under an umbrella of land redistribution bill. So it must address acquisition and then it must address distribution. And distribution also includes use and all of those things. So let's deal with the first part of it. The first part then would be, well, the land prices in South Africa are unduly expensive. Land is too expensive in this country. Talking about fallow land, I'm not talking about buildings, I'm just talking about open spaces. It's too expensive, right? Why? Because land is an instrument of speculation of economic speculation in South Africa. People buy land and they go overseas. And then they come back and they hope that the value of the land has tripled. Not because of any investment that they have made in the land. It has tripled because the state has built a road next to the piece of land. Because the state has put in water infrastructure next to the land. Because the state has put a township next to the land. Or because the state has built a city next to the land. That's how the value of the land appreciates in a very artificial way. And that is called land speculation. There is a lot of land speculation in South Africa, right? And so, which drives the prices of the land up. Right. And so the first thing is, if the state is going to acquire land, it's got to acquire the land on affordable prices, not thumb sag prices as a consequence of land speculation, but realistic prices. If it cannot acquire the land on realistic fair prices, then it has to acquire the land forcibly. And by forcibly, I don't mean the bulldozers that they used under the Group Areas Act. But I mean legally forcibly, because an expropriation is a forced sale or an enforced sale, right? But how would this expropriation work? And I just want again to uh, deal with two myths around expropriation. The first myth is that you can do an expropriation under a willing seller, willing buyer. An expropriation, by definition, there is no willing seller in an expropriation. There is only a willing buyer, the state, they're no willing seller. So the ANC has created an artificial paradigm in which under the 1997 white paper on land, it introduced the notion that the state as the sole buyer of land for redistribution purposes can apply willing seller, willing buyer, which increases the level of speculation on land. Because what actually happens is that as soon as people know that the Department of uh, 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 Education wants the land for a school, the prices go up, right? And as soon as everyone knows that this, this part is about to be expropriated because we need to build a railway line for, for how train, the prices suddenly shoot up. So it feeds into land speculation. Right, and we have no legal instrument to address land speculation. So 
If you are serious then about, so the one goal is to, the land must be available at affordable prices, not artificial prices driven by speculation. Number two, the state should have the potential to force the sale not by applying willing seller, willing buyer, because willing seller, willing buyer was never designed to apply in the context of expropriation, where there is only one buyer, it is the state, and the seller is whatever the state decides is the seller. And there is no market for expropriation. There's no market for expropriation. It is not as if you are looking at a newspaper on a Sunday, trying to see which properties are available in a particular neighborhood, which constitutes the market. In the context of the state, the state identifies a need and it identifies a specific property to resolve that need. So we could never apply this. Interestingly, in my own research, I found that the apartheid judges, in fact, the union judges were clear on this, that you could never apply willing seller, willing buyer in the context of an expropriation because you always have uh, it's actually a figment because there's never really a willing seller uh, and a willing buyer. There's never really a price because that whole willing seller, willing buyer is based on this notion that there is a price that is produced by a market. And that that when you try and find out how are they determining this, what you ultimately find is that they are asking property valuers to look around similarly situated properties in order to decide whether or not price of a particular property should be X or Y. Most of that is thumbs up. It's speculative, it's arbitrary. There's no science behind it. So if you then introduce an expropriation law, it's got to do away with willing seller, willing buyer. But then how does it work? It's got to design a system in which some properties will be paid above what you could call market value, and some properties would be paid below market value, and some properties would be taken for zero, for nothing, right? What you cannot have, you cannot have a one-size-fits-all, right? You cannot say a one-size-fits-all, where everything can be taken with no value or everything can be taken with value. And I've made this example many times. I've acted for the, in fact, I continue to act for the community in Polobeni, an Australian company has come in. It wants to develop uh, titanium. Fine. But the community says no. The government is entitled to expropriate the land and then remove the community and allow the mine to mine if it wants. The question is, if the government elected to expropriate, what compensation should be paid to the citizens of Colombia? Now, those people who don't see the need to distinguish would accept that those people should be paid nothing if everything is without compensation, right? But then that's where the inequity is, right? So you would say, well, in those cases, then maybe those people should be paid above what the mine would work. But then it means you cannot put in law that everything that is taken by the state is without compensation. What you need is a gliding scale. So that's the first part of it is, is deciding how the state will acquire the land. There is a new, well, maybe not that new, but there is a a dimension to it, which is where, why does the state not just own everything, right? Now, sure, you can have that debate. I promise you, Black South Africans will oppose any idea that the state should suddenly own their properties. They will say, for the first time in history, we have the possibility of owning our own farms. And as soon as that opportunity arises, those farms are being taken by the state. That's what my clients have told me in, in Gonyama Trust Land. That's what they've told me in Tolobin. Uh, but if people want to try this idea of everything owned by the state, they must tell the communities that. So then that's the first part of the land redistribution. But then the second part of it is the redistribution part. And again, there are some complexities here that we have to look into. The, the one area is, well, who gets the land, right? Who gets the land? Now, the problem we've had in South Africa around this has been, again, the absence of a comprehensive policy on the selection of beneficiaries. We, we have no way of deciding who the beneficiaries ought to be. And the consequence has been what? I've referred to in the book as elite capture. The, the people that tend to get the land 
right? Are people that have got access to the political networks and the connections, and some of them, in fact, have worked for the state before. You know, so the question then is, how do you turn that into a system in which the people that really get the land are those that deserve? So they can deserve because of their economic circumstances, or they can deserve because of their entrepreneurial flair. So some people are genuine farmers, but what we have in this country is a funny system in which the people that are getting farms are not themselves farmers. And what ultimately ends up happening is that these farms are then used as weekend getaways, right, by a few uh, uh, politically connected. So, so the first thing is deciding who gets this land. The, the next thing is deciding what is the land used for? At the moment, most of those debates, those questions rather, are answered by landowners because our policy is currently primarily driven by landowners. So this, what gets to be done on the land? The state can impose those conditions. What gets to be done on the produce of the land? The state again can impose those conditions. And then it must address this critical part. And I'm gonna say this and, and close. What support, if, if the land is used for farming, what support should be given to the emerging farmers? Remember that I, when, in my, when I began, I began by drawing the example of Van Riebeek himself in the Van Riebeek diaries saying, the new and emergent um, farming class will not succeed unless we have four conditions. We give them the land for free, we give them labor, we give them uh, 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 tax breaks, and we guarantee them access to the markets. And that is how they began. Now, you can apply the same model. It's a very simple model. Right now, the land bank is in a state of paralysis. But if you look at its loan book, right, 12 billion, well, it's 40 billion uh, rands worth of loan book. 12 billion rands of that loan book are non-performing loans, right? And they've had to write down so much, I think it's now at 20 billion, uh, basically uh, write off rather than write down. So which means you need another institution or the land bank itself to play the role of being a DFI, mm -hmm. to provide developmental finance. Not in its current model, because its current model was distorted in 2004 when Tabumbeke decided that the land bank should land on security. Now, once you say that you should land on security, you're no longer DFI because the people that will be able to borrow are people with security, but the intention is to ensure that you facilitate the acquisition of security, right? So you've got to think about how should these small scale farmers be supported financially? Right now, the figures are astonishing. 78% of the farms that have been acquired through the restitution process or the redistribution process are not performing. They are lying fallow. Now, that's not a reflection on the ability of black farmers. It's simply a reflection on the failure of the state to provide the support. And the support primarily is in two ways. One is financial support. And two is access to the markets. And until you've addressed those two problems that any farmer would need, whether it's white or black, doesn't matter. Any farmer needs finance to start and it must be patient capital because farming is a big job. And then it must be access to the markets. They need to know what they should do with the produce. And so you can't continuously tell us about whether there's food insecurity when in fact the conditions of black farmers to produce the food for the nation are in fact dismal. I think at this point, I should stop. Uh, that's the future I see. I see a future in which we go back to section 25, subsection five, and we focus on need for land on an equitable basis. And that applies to urban land and it applies to agricultural land. Uh, thank you, Comrade SG. Thank you very much, Advocate Nukai Tobi for giving us and painting a picture of where we come from the genesis of our land problems from a legal uh, point of view, uh, we are going to allow you to ask your questions. And um, given the limited time, I would not ask many questions. 
Uh, but just to observe, it would appear to me, advocate, that we have even failed, just in terms of the subsistence to farmers. We have even failed when Mangope, Matanzi, Mance, they succeeded in, in supporting a, a Black farmers. Um, I also note that you are also arguing that we have failed to implement the bare minimum that is allowable uh, in the constitution. And perhaps as you respond to some of the questions, uh, you would expand uh, uh, for me um, uh, your ultimate reservations around the nationalization of the land. Uh, I, I, I heard you loud and clear around what, um, what the communities would think. Uh, but do you not think uh, that if we nationalize the land uh, and, and invest it in the hands of the state, um, we, we would be then in a position to support everybody other than this um, a piecemeal approach where people claim land, they have to bring title deeds and so on and so forth. And when I ask this question, I ask that perhaps we, we don't deal with the expediency um, uh, the, the, that um, clips in, that because we have a particular attitude um, uh, towards the governing party informed by their own corrupt practices, that we now perhaps have an attitude against um, the state. I'm going to take um, uh, two questions that I see in the chat box and allow you to just respond a bit and then open it up for people who want to put oral questions. Please do raise uh, your hands. I also want to acknowledge that this program is watched in many countries. As a result, we have amongst us Professor John Trimble, I've got to acknowledge you from the All African People's Revolutionary Party uh, based in Washington, DC and many other African countries. They are all watching. We also have Comrade Mafafa from the NNLC of Swaziland. These are our partners as Azapo as we continue the journey of land uh, repossession. We have a question from Mahauda. Uh, that says very informative indeed, Mahauda. But why don't we make class action for those of us who need land? Timbi Sopaga says, Advocate Ngai Tobi, was it a fair settlement of the land question? What is a fair settlement of the land question, rather? That is politically correct and acceptable to all parties involved. This question was asked much earlier on. You may in part have touched it on your own proposal around the uh, land redistribution bill, but you may touch on it. Um, Advocate Ngai Tobi? And please do raise your hands, colleagues, for more questions. Yeah. No, th thank you. I mean, I think let me just start with the last point around. Well, what is the, the, the was the first settlement arrived at? You know, on the on the on the land question. I think one part I I skipped in my presentation because of of time constraints, which I thought I was going to to deal with, but I, I did it. Is the Southern African experience? Um, I, I don't know enough about North Africa and French Africa. But the countries that we have sort of a closest historical uh, similarities is Zimbabwe and Namibia. Uh, Zimbabwe was occupied by the British at about the same time as they occupied us. In fact, they thought the whole thing was the same thing. And Namibia was basically an apartheid country, just like South Africa, Southwest Africa. So what happened in Namibia and in Zimbabwe, right? This is for me the simplest explanation. In Lancaster, they had to decide in Zimbabwe, well, what are we going to do about property that was acquired by the British during the period of colonialism? So, now, you have two options there. The first is you destroy everything. Destroy everything, 
No one is entitled to any property. We start afresh, and then we can start a new property system. The other is you allow everyone to keep what they had under colonialism. And then you hope over time, you know, to implement a redistributive approach. So the choice in Lancaster was to allow everybody to keep what they had. Right? And so came back from Lancaster, the British still kept all of the properties that they had acquired under colonialism, unfair and unjust as it was. That was the scheme. That was in 1979. In 1989, right, in uh, Namibia, the same question arose, right? Namibia was an apartheid country. It was moving towards freedom. Question again arose, what are we going to do to the land that was acquired by the whites of Namibia unfairly and unjustly by genocide, by apartheid? They also agreed that the land will remain in the hands of the whites and that they would then build a scheme in which the land would be taken from the whites. Now, that model is precisely what happened in South Africa in 1994, right? What are we going to do with the land that the whites have, some people say, stolen, but they've acquired unjustly? Let's put it that way, um, not to be unfairly provocative. So they've acquired the land unjustly. What are we going to do with them? They keep it. The three countries all had constitutions. There's, there's the Lancaster Constitution, which contains three clauses. Again, I analyze those clauses. One is there's a right to expropriate. Two, when you expropriate, you pay compensation. In Zimbabwe, it was stronger because it was not just an equitable, it was actually market-related compensation. And three, if you have a complaint, you go to court. You know, that's in the land. And so when people look at the South African Constitution, they think it's unique. It's actually not. And then in Namibia, they also have the same constitutional framework. You know, uh, you, 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 you can get the land. It must be taken by the state. When it is taken by the state, the person who loses it gets some compensation. It's fair compensation. It doesn't have to be final compensation. And then you look at the South African constitution in section 25. Yes, they keep the land. We can get it when we get it. Uh, it will be subject to some sort of compensation. It may, and then if there's a complaint, it must go to court. So that's the same scheme that is applicable. So in, in 20, it was 2019, I, I had a chance to be in Namibia and I spoke to the president then of Namibia, President Gangob, and I said, look, I find this very fascinating that we basically have the same structure uh, of, of land reform. You know? And then he, he mentioned, um, his own experience during the negotiation of the Namibian constitution and the overbearing influence of the World Bank. Because this was the period of uh, neoliberalism, you know. And so th that I think for me is the critical question that the transition may be left for us to resolve, you know, which is the, the, the basic structure of disposition was left untouched. And the plan mm. was that it would be resolved after um, freedom. You know? And so for, for me, then the question is, what? how are we going to resolve it after freedom? And this is where I say that what we've got is political power, which gives us legal power. And that is why my own theoretical framework of this thing is institutional changes. It's driving this true institutional change, right? And one platform for this is parliament. Another platform for this is the executive. You know, because I don't see any other revolutionary ways out of this quagmire. I see the institutions that we've set up for freedom as the key institutions to resolve the problem. But playing a much more radical and much more open uh, uh, role than they have hitherto been playing. So, so, the, so, and hence I say, where we are right now in South Africa, we are in fact in conditions that are ripe for an expansive land redistribution bill that is not constrained by neoliberalism. And where are we going to get that? We're going to get it in parliament. And that's where the pressure for me really ought to be. So far, parliament has in fact failed to play this role and should have been item number one of the transition. So that's where uh, I, I see it. I, I don't want to be critical about Zimbabwe's choices 
But what we do know about Zimbabwe's choice is that in the first 20 years, they actually did nothing about land at all mm-hmm. until the people decided to occupy the land on, the, on their own, right? If they decide to occupy land in South Africa, fine. But we have not seen any movement towards that direction. And so, which means, again, it's institutional that's going to drive the, the, the process of land reform. Then I, I want to touch a bit then on nationalization. I mean, I, I just think my own experience with communities is that communities want to own the land in their own names. They, they don't want the state to own land. This has nothing to do with whether the state is an ANC state or the state is, a, is an EFF state. The, the communities want a sense of dignity from title deed. That's the South African mentality. I've been very critical of the title deed model myself. But my own experience is that there are very few takers to this notion. It's politicians actually who say that the state must own the land. The communities actually want to own the land themselves. So I think that the, the resistance is going to come from there. It's not, it's not going to come from you know, activists and intellectuals or anything. It's going to be politicians saying, give us a right to own the land on your behalf. And it's going to be communities saying, but that's not going to happen. So that's where I think the, the resistance and I don't see the, to be honest, I just don't see the benefits of, of nationalization or fled. There might be benefits of nationalizing uh, the sea, and there might be benefits of nationalizing minerals. I just don't see the benefits of nationalizing land. Um, I think that the, the bureaucracy just of administering it, you know, the bureaucracy of administering stands. I mean, you and everyone knows that going to a village, and how difficult the bureaucracy is. So I just see that there are more uh, problems than than possibilities for for realistic change. I see the state has played a very limited role, the the, the, the transformative role, but thereafter as leaving it to us. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mugai Tobi. Uh, there are questions on the chat box, but at this point in time, we go to the number one citizen of the party, President Elvis Kadema. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Swepu and uh, Comrade Mugai Tobi. Tobi, we are very proud of you. You need to know that. You already know it anyway. But uh, uh, listening to you, I noticed that uh, yeah, you just went past uh, any possible mention of uh, the, the, the Portuguese uh, colonialism, you know, uh, their invasion of the land as they're trying to find a sea route to China in the, in the 15th uh, century. And then there's a lot of havoc they did on that side of uh, Teguini. But I also noticed that a... Um, uh, yeah, there is a nuanced a uh, skepticism against uh, the nationalization of uh, the land in your uh, presentation and but you are saying the reason for that is that uh, your clients uh, seem to be favoring uh, the title deeds model and uh, um, my problem with that is that uh, that seems to be individualistic it's not sim- it does it's not informed by uh, the communal and the, the the black solidarity desire of the people as informed by the struggle and uh, but the question i wanted to ask you is that a uh, what would you say about uh, the notion of uh, the Khoisan people saying, no, 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 everyone else has got nothing to do about the land. We are the owners of this land. When in fact, uh, you yourself have said they were, they, the Abangoni people were here, I mean, about uh, 1,000 years ago. And then in fact, a modern life, modern human life in Azania is about 125,000 years ago. That is, that's the Middle Stone Age beyond the Khoisan people themselves. And I'm saying, if this is left like that, it undermines the anti-racist struggle, the anti-colonial struggle, the black solidarity, and the struggle for land reposition. Thank you. Uh, bef- before we, before you respond to that, thank you very much, uh, President Gagema, for an- asking that question. Before we go to, you, you obviously noting advocate, um, and we, we know your, the sharpness of your memory. 
Um, before I go to come to you, John Tremble, let me just ask, um, let me just read one important question asked, um, uh, which I think is quite important. I, I see you have covered it in your book, uh, Advocate. Um, Matabo asks from the Free State, where do you locate women in the principle of land and equitable uh, ownership? I will come to the next two, but I want you to answer after John so that you then deal with the three questions. Professor Tremble. Uh, thank you. I'd like to start by, by thanking our, our presenter. He was very thorough and I, I, I've gotten his book and I find it very fascinating. Uh, my question is, why aren't we examining uh, Zimbabwe's approach to land reclamation more? Uh, I lived in Zimbabwe for a couple of years. I was there, particularly in 2003, 2004, and, and observed several things. One, they had a regional support structure set up to support uh, the farmers, similar to what uh, I hear you suggesting. Secondly, they had a significant budget set aside to support these farmers, which would include in tractors, seed, and, and other things. Uh, third, a key point is the initial approach that they took. It's not about expropriation, it's about reclamation. It's about reclaiming the land that is justly belongs to the people in the area. Uh, and the other thing is about distribution. And the, the distribution was very localized so that they were able to distribute to over 300,000 families. My question is why aren't we examining uh, the more closely uh, the Zimbabwe approach and examining more closely actually the problems that they're having, which are directly uh, linked to uh, the fact that they have sanctions that have basically crippled the economy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Trimble. Um, Advocate Ngaitori? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe to start with the last one, I mean, I agree with the first two points entirely. I mean, I, I think that the, you, you need institutional support for for, for 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 local farmers. I mean, you've got to move away. If 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 the plan is maybe let me put it this way: if the plan is let us resolve the problem of land injustice and let's resolve and the reason we must do so is so that we resolve the problem of hunger, starvation. People must eat from the land. Right? We have to move away from the mentality of big farmer. Right, this idea that we're going to have large scale farms and they are going to produce tons and tons and tons of millions for distribution into much more localized, right, much more localized uh, 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 producers for not for subsistence, commercial, but on a local scale. So, if that's your vision, and and, and sometimes the ANC says this, it's agrarian revolution. They say agrarian revolution. <laughs> it's very funny, it's agrarian. But most of its focus, most of the economic focus of South Africa is urban. You know, they're, they're interested in industry, but every manifesto is agrarian, agrarian. So if you're going to do agrarian, then it's got to be localized, small scale. But if that is so, if that is so, then what we've got to do is, I think the, the speaker says regional support, which I entirely support. I mean, I used uh, local support. So it could be municipal, provincial, but it's got to be localized uh, support. And then secondly, the budget is very crucial. And I, I didn't mention the budget, but the one point about South Africa is that the budget for land, despite the claim that South Africa is moving towards an agrarian revolution, the actual budget allocated for land has been declining. And people will be surprised by this. It started declining during the Jacob Zuma years. Right? And the decline has continued. And, and, and it's astonishing because the last five years of South Africa have been filled with the rhetoric of land reform. But that rhetoric has not been matched by resources available, which itself is a, 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 a departure from the obligation that make the land available to those who need it and make the resources available to those who need it. So, so I agree with those 
uh, entirely. I mean, I also agree. I'm, I'm not that critical, actually, of, of Zimbabwe. I try to understand Zimbabwe and to explain it. You know, The point I'm making about it is simply that the Lancaster framework is actually the same framework that we ended up having ourselves, right? The same framework that the Namibians uh, ended up having. After 20 years, it was abandoned in Zimbabwe, right? And that's why I'm asking for South Africa to start abandoning it. And the one way of abandoning that framework is to move towards redistribution. That was the goal from the beginning. So that's the, 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 the approach I am, I, am, uh, I am proposing. And I agree fully that we've got to be looking closely at uh, what worked in Zimbabwe and uh, as opposed to this uh, idea that you know there was chaos in Zimbabwe. The one critique in my book about Zimbabwe was the destruction of the rule of law. That's that's the primary critique I have about the process is the destruction of the rule of law. So so but the rest of it I think I'm entirely with you then. And then if I can uh, and, and I must admit that I personally haven't looked into that but I, I because I looked only in the historical legal framework for land reform, and it was striking for me how similar it was to South Africa and how the results were also similar. You know, <laughs> it was fascinating, actually. <laughs> and I want to then talk uh, to President uh, uh, Um I, I think the point I'm making about nationalization, I agree with you about communalism, right? The, Communalism, I support fully. It's the idea that communities are running their affairs on the land and they are organizing and mobilizing their affairs. The, so communalism, I fully support. It's, it's nationalization. It's the top-down statism. Let me put it that way. It's the statism that I think is going to present a challenge for South Africa. It's, uh, but but the, but the idea that communities are driving the process, it's from below. I, I support that entirely. There I see the state playing a very minimal role, which is the role of acquisition and the role of distribution, finance and support. But thereafter, most of the work has to be done at a communal level. But again, we've got to help the communities. And that's the argument I tried to make. We've got to help the communities to develop robust systems, but it must still be systems that the communities are in charge of and the systems that the communities are in control, of, not the systems that are controlled by the political bosses. And so that's my skepticism. I'm not opposed to communalism, I'm opposed to statism. If, if nationalism, if nationalization is about communalism, then we're talking the same thing. But if nationalization is about statism, like Stalinist state control, then I see problems um, uh, ahead, and I see lots of resistance from our communities. And then I'm entirely with you on, on the First Nations. You know what is funny about the, this idea of uh, festism? It, it, is that, again, and that's something I try to look into about only the history of the Eastern Cape, you know, and the fact that there was a stage in which people did not identify themselves as Fosa or Koi, but they had become so integrated and even began to share the same language that they did not see these uh, sort of tribal or, or, or racial distinctions. And, and most of this movement, this, this movement at, at establishing a tribe and this movement at, uh, I would say, the, the denationalization or the de-Africanization, maybe that's the correct word, it's the de-Africanization of the colored, right? you know, of the Eastern Cape Colored in particular, is actually a political project that begins in 1910, right? Because the obsession of the union government at that point is to create uh, new races. And one of their main objects is to separate the, the native from the colored, you know, whereas in fact, the native and the colored were once the same thing, you know? And that movement was actually central to the creation of the apartheid ideology from 1948. And one of its consequences, unfortunate consequences, was to, to de-Africanize colored people, making themselves believe that they were not Africans. And that's been where I would say that organizations like the PAC and Azapo have been so strong. It's reclaiming the Africanness of colored people, right? Um, 
And so that much, I agree. And unfortunately, what has now happened is that there is a new movement, and one of the uh, organizations driving this new movement has been Afroforum, a new movement of festism, which is basically a racist movement, right? Because what it begins to do is to say, the colors are the first people, right? Colors are the first people. And it's the same people who designed race and say the colors are the first people. And not all colors are the first people. Certain colors are the first people. And then, and then the Ngunis are the intruders. <laughs> the Tosas and the Zulus are the intruders, right? It's classic apartheid mindset, you know? And so, so we then have a duty, and I, I, when I've debated actually with a lot of communities in the Cape and elsewhere, I've had to confront festism, you know, confront festism, and then to go back to like true Pan-Africanism, you know, uh, about th this, this actually was a Western notion imposed on us, and it's now being revived in the context of land. But the goal of this revival is creating divisions again, you know? And so it's absolutely central in our own imagination of land to always tie it with a, a proper perspective of, uh, of Africanism. So I'm very pleased, uh, Comrade Kagama, that you've raised this, this issue of, uh, of festism. I, I think it's actually dogging um, a proper discussion on land reform. Uh, and then women, yes, I, I've had a full chapter on uh, on women and land, and the and the basically two points I was trying to explore there was our land reform outcomes, you know, the outcomes. If you just check who has got what, right? We have a final situation where on the redistribution front, thirty seven percent of beneficiaries are women headed households, thirty seven percent. So what that means is that sixty three percent that's Men. On the restitution front, 25% are women headed households. 25% on the restitution. So, which means the people that are claiming the land as having been the victims of forced removals are men. Now, I don't understand how on earth this happened because in African society, the people that work the land are the women. And that was enhanced during the process of apartheid when. Black men were forced to work in the mines. And when they who they left behind looking after the children were the women. And how they were doing so was to look after the land. But the claimants tended to be men, which is a reflection of something else that is happening in, in society, which is the way patriarchy transforms itself. You know, it's become almost acceptable that the head of the family. And this, I'm not talking about families with a husband. I'm talking about families sometimes with no husband. But an uncle will come and make the claim. The elder son will come and make the claim. So we have to debate the patriarchal nature of land reform because it's been a very, very patriarchal um, uh, system. And so the first point was to then look historically, you know, at the truthfulness of this claim around men being owners of the land. And I actually found that it has no historical roots. You know, I use the example, the, the chapter actually begins with Princess Emma, you know, who herself became, uh, I think probably the first title did holder, you know, under the British system. And the British were giving effect of what they had seen. Now, Princess Emma was the daughter, the eldest daughter of one of the kings of the Niger, uh, Sandy. You know, and and uh, Dre gave a title to it because he said, "Well, what I see around me, I see a lot of Tosa women being landowners. So I'm just giving effect to their culture, and how this has now been distorted in the modern day that women were never landowners for me was very odd. So I was looking at these two questions. One is the question of ownership. The second is the question of use of the land. And I found that actually in both of them, in historical terms, women have been owners of the land, but they have also been the people working in the land. But the outcomes have distorted both of those. And I'm trying to go back then to say, well, if this is the true history, how can we move the land debate forward in ways that are as less patriarchal as they are at the moment? Um, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we've taken uh, much of your time. We've gone um, over the time, but I, I just want to um, confuse all the questions that are on the chat box. 
and uh, that helps you you finish off uh, uh, with them. Um, uh, comment by Combed um, Khanar. Uh, it says, advocate based on your submission. Is it correct to say that the ANC and not the people, at least not black people, through through Kodesa has legalized land acquisition through deceit and and conquest? Is it constitutionally possible to call for a referendum uh, on the legitimacy and legality of the current constitution as a whole, with a particular reference to the land? Interesting debate. Uh, almost 30 years in democracy, we are still struggling with land distribution, and the oppressors continue to enrich themselves and rob us with peace in the form of an estate. Municipalities are at the center of land distribution, and something drastic must be done to accelerate land distribution for human settlement and for purposes of food security and empowerment of blacks. We will have to continue this discussion. That's just a comment. Nancy Wright writes, can you discuss the relationship between land reform and extractivism? Can land rights be separated from the raw material, water, et cetera, that lies beneath the land? Should these resources be privately owned? What role is played by international imperialism? Ngongo says the issue of women is also not perpetuated by the past patriarchal methods of acquiring RDP houses, um, that they were easily distributed to men or those married. Uh, let me go up a bit. And uh, notes that very interesting debate. Thank you very much, advocate. Uh, Matawa has asked this question. She thanks you for an informative session, but she wants to know what is your view advocate on the 30 years land leases um, of government versus equitable land uh, distribution. Uh, there was a question, which is the last one I want to look at from Molifi Fogong. He says the context of land redistribution or ownership as espoused by advocate is premised on capitalism, whereby the land is commodified. People that advocate refers to find it attractive because they can use the land as security to borrow money from the bank. What we need to sort out the allocation of land in traditional communities. Quite frankly, communal land ownership provides the most secure tenure on land because even SARS can't attract, attach rather, a property built on communal land. We need to sort out this challenge. The challenge is in communal land ownership and not discard nationalization of the land. Those would be the last uh, questions, um, Advocate uh, Nugai Tobi, that you respond to. Unfortunately, we can no longer take uh, uh, questions. Thank you. I think that I, I don't want to sort of not respond in the sense of, you know, it's a uh, uh, dialogue, but I think just to make sort of concluding sort of uh, observations, I mean, you know, I, I didn't speak a lot about sort of communal land and the problems there in communal land, you know, that we, we have to confront. It, it, it's very sort of attractive, you know, to paint this uh, picture of tranquility in communal areas. But when you actually are in the communal areas and you look at the struggles of the communities there, particularly around chieftaincy and around uh, patriarchy, then you realize that we have to confront the idea, again, a distortion of the customer systems, which assumes that the chiefs are the owners of the land. And because the chiefs are the owners of the land, they are entitled to eject people from the land or to dictate what they may or may not do. So I've been moving for a system that's equitable in which the power is uh, channeled downwards, you know, rather than upwards. You know, so 
So, so again, I, th I think we should just be a bit nuanced talking about the, the communal model. Secondly, the communal model is not properly developed in South Africa, right? Because of the distortions. And the two systems I've studied more has been Natal and the Cape. And Natal primarily through the prism of Theophilus Shepstein, right? uh, who is responsible for the distortion of the Natal communal model system, which remained the law in Natal, by the way, until 1987. The Shepsteinian model remained the law. I mean, I mean who knows that uh, it was in fact Shepstein who said the maximum number of cattle that must be paid for Lobola is 10 cows. And now everyone believes that to be custom, <laughs> but it was actually a proclamation passed in 1867, right? And, and it now, the same thing about the excessive power that the chiefs have over the land, those are all believed to be part and parcel of custom, but actually they were not. So in true customary system, the land really belonged in the family. So everyone knew this is your burial ground as this family, and this is your grazing ground as this family. And no one could just come and, and, and take it. So yeah, sure, there were no title deeds, but there was a very strong system of, of, of tenure. And then the next comment I just want to make is around this, uh, this debate about, well, what do we actually make of 1994 in terms of like its significance in the permanent journey towards freedom? You know, What do we make of 1994? Look, whatever its limits, where I personally do not think I would have struck a better deal, but other people think they would have done a better deal. But whatever its limits, my, my focus is really to work with the current instruments. So the one most obvious instrument is land redistribution. I, I just cannot understand why there is not enough noise about land redistribution. Another is the fact that we've got 5,800 claims that are piling up in the bureaucracy of the government. I just, just don't understand that, you know, why we don't have that system. And then the, uh, we don't have those resolved. And then the, the, and then the last uh, thing I just want to say is, 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 is uh, it's around this, this uh, idea that when we debate the land, we've got to ground our debate in people's experiences. You know, there is quite a lot I find in, in which we elites, you know, uh, speak on behalf of the people. Uh, and when we do so, we sometimes forget what the people actually want and what the people actually think for themselves. I've been I've found it very, very humbling when I go to Kailicha and uh, or Tolobeni and integrate myself with those communities and listen to their needs. And often actually they are quite contrary to what I assume, you know, is, is their need. And that's why, you know, sometimes I don't get like, even the expropriation thing. I didn't initially take a position on expropriation, but it's only after I'd gone to communities and spoken to them. And I actually realized that there isn't a popular support for it, you know. And, and you would assume that, in fact, there is, but I realized that there isn't a popular support. What there was is, what they were saying is that we need the land to work for us and our children. We don't need the land to work for the state, you know. And that's often where... I find that there is a, a, a disconnect, right? A disconnect between what the elites are saying about the land and what the people are saying about the land. So I think that this is a process issue and not so much a substance issue. So a lot of the things I write about land, uh, of course, there's a lot of research I've ind independently done, but a lot of them are actually informed. And that's why most of it are actually counterintuitive because they, they don't coincide with a particular ideology but they are grounded with what the, 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 the people say. So, so maybe that's something that for us, maybe as a Zappo, that we've got to be spending a lot of time uh, understanding the needs and understanding how those needs are themselves transforming because the needs of 1913 are no longer today's needs. And so that transformation, we've got to be in the heartbeat of where that is, that is happening. Other than that, uh, Comrade SG, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure to to be at at Azapwa. It feels at home, and uh, hopefully we can uh, we can look at another debate in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Ngai Toby. And of course, I am uh, going to call you immediately here after uh, to take two more minutes of your time. And yes, Azapwa would be inviting you. We are in the process of organizing a land summit because the debate 
must continue. We actually need our people to, uh, to talk about land, to ignite uh, the, the debate around land. And I want to end this um, session today um, by thanking the attendees as well, uh, who asked uh, critical questions to keep uh, the platform alive. We end it with a quote in your book, Advocate, from William Falcon, who wrote, the past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. The cries of Shabville, of Langa, of Soweto reverberate with us once again. We shall remember where this all stood, the land. Thank you very much. See you guys here next week, same time. A very interesting guest we are going to have as well, uh, which we will announce in due course. But thank you very much for giving us your Sundays and um, every Sunday to debate with us critical issues. From Apple Live, we say thank you and goodbye.